Hello and welcome to another lecture and this one is all about thunderstorms and especially tornadoes. Um, so tornadoes are a huge hazard in some parts of the world, especially North America, it gets more than anywhere else in the world. Um, and they can cause huge uh, destruction when they, they touch down. Um, they have wind speeds, we're talking up to 300 miles per hour or even slightly higher than that. Uh, to put that in perspective, we say hurricane, the category five hurricane is up to around about 185 miles per hour. So, you know, a lot more than that. So they literally can even pick up vehicles, uh, these very high winds, um, destroy houses, um, et cetera. So it's something we need to uh, know about um, and the science behind them and um, how we can, if at all, mitigate against them. It's all really about um, uh, watches and warnings uh, to, to evacuate if possible or, or to take shelter. Um, Okie doke, so we're going to, before we talk about tornadoes, we'll be talking a bit, a bit more about um, thunderstorms. Uh, before that, a uh, few things on this, this outline here. So it'll be, um, I'm going to start off by talking a bit about weather. Um, why does it uh, rain, essentially? And uh, then um, what, um, something about fronts, and we'll find out actually these fronts, these warm and cold fronts are one of the, one of the, um, mechanisms for pushing air aloft, pushing air upwards. And as we'll see, that's one of the key ways to um, cause precipitation. Um, and related to fronts as well, um, we were look, talking about mid-latitude cyclones, which very much bring the weather in the United States. Um, as the weather travels from the west to the east across, across that country. Um, and with fronts as well, especially cold fronts, they produce a lot of um, thunderstorms. At their, their frontal at their boundary and so we're talking about thunderstorms how do they develop what they are their occurrence etc and that leads on finally nicely to tornadoes because tornadoes are very much associated with thunderstorms they're very much associated with these weather fronts colliding uh, so hence you know everything in this lecture is kind of leading up up to that all right so first topic though um the rain why did it rain uh, why do we have uh, precipitation? Uh, what causes it? Um, all right, well, it's all to do with um, something uh, called um, humidity. Um, so it's the amount of, uh, which is sort of a, a measure of the amount of uh, water vapor within a, a parcel of air. So let's say maybe a, a cubic meter of air or a cubic foot of air, and how much water vapor uh, that can hold, like what's the maximum? And the maximum would be uh, what we call saturated air, and that, that would be at 100% humidity. Um, so when it reaches that 100% humidity um, and reaches saturation, uh, the water vapor then, you, that parcel of air can't contain any more water vapor. So then it condenses into the liquid form as liquid water droplets. Um, and in the atmosphere, that would be as, as sort of clouds. Um, and then following that, you can then have uh, precipitation and, and rain. Um, so it's all to do, as I say, this is key variable um, humidity and getting to uh, creating the right conditions to make it 100% um, uh, or saturated. Um, so saturation can occur critically when um, air cools to what's called the dew point temperature. Um, so um, if you cool air, a fixed volume of, of air, like a cubic meter, let's say again, if you cool that cubic meter of air, um, the, um, it can contain less water vapor, essentially. So in other words, if you cool the air, it reaches saturation much easier, or you just lower it for two, um, as you lower, as you cool, cool the air, the humidity rises until finally you get 100%. So um, and that, that temperature is called the dew point uh, temperature. Um, so saturation can occur where air cools to this dew point temperature. Um, example. Uh, here we have a glass, a chilled glass drink, uh, you know, ice in, so it's cold. Um, and you can see a, a condensation on, on the outside of that glass. I get <laughs> where I am, I have single pane uh, glazing in my windows and on a cold morning, um, you know, there's condensation on the inside. It's the same principle where it's, where it's, um, it's cold, cold, the cold air outside is causing that. So why do, do things condense like, like on the image you see now? Um, it's basically um, the surrounding, very thin layer of air surrounding that glass you can see has been cooled from the, the cold, you know, from the, the cold chill drink 
um, to the dew point temperature. Um, so that's the thin envelope of um, air has become saturated and um, condenses to form water droplets on, on the outside. So, um, so that's the key. In other words, you're lowering the temperature, you reduce satur saturation of the air, and um, th then you have uh, condensation in this case. And the same thing happens in the atmosphere, as we'll see. If you rise, if you, if, if, as you go up in elevation through the atmosphere, you know, one, two, three, four, five kilometers or miles, miles up, gradually the temperature decreases, it gets colder. Um, so gradually, eventually you get to this uh, condensation level or, or saturation uh, point. And that's basically where, where we have clouds. So the cloud base is basically at where the temperature is low enough, where the air is now saturated, 100% uh, humidity and uh, because of the temp low temperatures and um, um, uh, 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 water droplets are formed or clouds. One, two. Okay, so um, the next uh, slide, this one shows two charts for um, two variables, temperature at the top in red, the red line and humidity at the bottom. And you'll see they're very, they're kind of inversely correlated. So when temperature is low, humidity is high or when, high, or, or when temperature, temperatures are high, the humidity is low. So um, you'll see in the early morning, around about 6 a.m., so it's, 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 it goes through a, a day here, um, you'll see the temperatures are, are low in Celsius, uh, right about sort of, you know, two, three degrees uh, Celsius there. Um, and the humidity is, at, is highest because colder temperature can contain less water vapor. Therefore, it's almost at the saturation point here. It's over 70% because of the cold temperatures. Then as the temperature rises during the day, if it's peak in the uh, late afternoon, uh, the humidity drops because warm air can contain more water vapor. Therefore, as a percentage, the, uh, the humidity is, is less, the relative humidity. Okay, so that's a key uh, very, uh, sort of correlation. So the key thing is you need to, to create the, the environment uh, for, um, um, for condensation and then clouds and then precipitation, which we'll be talking about. You need to uh, cool the air. Okay, so um, just to recap, so when it reaches 100% humidity, the air is saturated and water vapour will condense as liquid water droplets. Uh, saturation can occur when the air cools to what's called a dew point temperature. When air is forced aloft um, um, in the atmosphere, um, it will expand and cool and reach what's called the condensation level um, altitude, which on this um, Diagram at the bottom right, uh, the condensation levels um, indicated indicated here, and here it is as in meters, so three thousand meters, so three kilometers um, elevation. Um, so gradually, as you go up, um, the, the air temperature cools. It's actually quite a fixed rate. Uh, so the rising air cools at right about ten degrees Celsius um, for every one thousand meters rise until the air reaches the dew point um, and condensation or cloud formation, essentially. Uh, begins. So that's why you have clouds, you know, that's certain ele elevation when you look up in the sky because that's the right uh, temperature for uh, condensation here and, and saturation. Um, so the clouds form and the droplets uh, within those clouds gradually get a bit larger, essentially, as, as the clouds develop. And finally, uh, gravity takes hold and those droplets will fall to Earth as rain. So that's essentially why we have rain. Um, those last, last couple of slides. All right, so um, but the key thing is there's various ways we can uh, force air aloft, if you will, or encourage air to rise. And one, one way is mountains. So you think of maybe in North America, the United States, uh, the, the rain, so the weather comes in from, from the west. And travels east always uh, usually um, and so the weather on the west coast is coming off all that moist air is coming off the pacific ocean it gets to a barrier which is uh, first the coastal range but then the sort of sierra nevada mountains in uh, california for example in the rockies um, and it is forced to rise over them and it as it rises it cools condenses and it rains so that's why you have a lot of rain in certain parts of the west coast you know like seattle and, and all the way down Parts of California um, uh, due due to that, that mountains, and that's why you have, for example, the temperate rainforests of, of Northern California because that wet weather there, uh, all the forests of, of, of Oregon and, and um, Seattle um, and uh, Washington State, for example. 
Um, so that loses its moisture. That air, by the way, then carries on eastwards over the mountains, um, but now it's dry and then it sinks into the uh, lower ground past the mountains and forms what's called a rain shadow desert, um, which where the rain, where the air lost its moisture from rain one side of the mountains, but continues and sinks um, and um, warms as it sinks and you have very um, sort of dry air. Then. Okay, so, um, and so that's one way mountains. Another way of making air rise are things called fronts. Um, these, these boundaries of air masses, uh, as we'll see. So fronts are, are boundaries that separate air masses of different densities. Um, so, and so different densities of often cold, a cold air mass or a warm air mass being two examples. Um, at these fronts, warmer, less dense air is forced um, aloft. And so the warmer air tends to be um, pushed upwards, it's less dense. Um, and the cooler, denser air often acts as a wedge to, to, uh, to, to force that air alo um, aloft uh, as well. So it's best to see these in diagrams, so we'll, we'll see them soon. Um, so the types of fronts, uh, I'm only going to me mention two, there are more than two. Uh, I'm going to mention warm fronts and cold fronts, but there are also other ones, occluded fronts and, and various others, sort of five, five or so in total. But we're just going to uh, tackle the two main ones, warm fronts and cold fronts. Um, so the diagram of the warm front um, uh, below, so it's a warm air, it's coming in from the left of, of this slide and replacing um, the, uh, the cooler air to the right. Um, it's replacing it and um, overriding it at the same time. And note the boundary between these two air masses is very quite a gentle gradient, a gentle slope. Here it's around about sort of one, in, one in 200 uh, gradient. Uh, there's a slow rate of advance of this front, and um, but you see air is being still forced aloft of this up this low gradient. Therefore, you're going to get condensation and clouds being formed, but they're kind of smeared out, if you will, across a large area, and uh, you get some rain, but it's pretty light rain, so a light to moderate precipitation, so kind of rain showers, uh, in other words, uh, associated with with a warm front. Um, the next one is a cold front, and you see straight away in the diagram you have a very steep boundary uh, compared to the previous one, the warm front with this one. So here cold air is moving in from the left here, and now it's replacing an area which was uh, occupied by warm air. And the boundary itself of this front is twice as steep, so what about 1 in 100 um, as a warm front. It advances faster uh, than a warm front as well. Um, so the air is quickly um, um, pushed upwards at the front, uh, this warm air, so it's this kind of boulder that comes along, it quickly forces the air upwards, uh, quite a relatively steep gradient, uh, you get condensation at a certain altitude, and uh, then precipitation, and this is when you, where you get actually heavy precipitation, um, or intense weather, so um, um, thunderstorms especially. So associated weather is more violent than a warm front, precipitation intense, but short duration, so you get these short intense um, thunderstorms or heavy rain showers associated with uh, cold fronts. And as we'll see, um, associated with these sort of fronts as well um, are tornadoes as well often associated with these, um, especially these tall cumulonimbus clouds, which are these big rain clouds. Uh, the weather behind the front, the cold air, and once that front's moved away, it's actually quite clear. You won't see any clouds generally. It's quite clear air, uh, but it's cold. So it's replaced, the whole, that whole area field of view now will be replaced by sort of, sort of clear, cold air as that front moves um, to the right in this case. Um, so this air moving, these fronts moving, they move across the United States or North America um, and, with, and they cause changing weather, they do. So the changes in weather are associated with the passage of what's called a middle latitude cyclone. Um, we talked about with hurricanes, cyclones being tropical cyclones, um, these aren't the same, quite the same thing. They are cyclonic circulations of air, they are sort of low pressure areas in a similar way, um, but these associate with the mid-latitude, so mid-latitude um, cyclone. Um, and they move across the United States um, from west to east, these big rotating um, low pressure areas, air masses, and they require typically sort of two to four days to pass over a specific region. So for the first 
Well, if you're on a, um, a specific point, say the East Coast, um, first you're getting the warm front come through, then a cold front in the center of that um, 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 area, that low pressure, then, then the other arm, the other side of it moves through. So it takes about two to four days for the whole thing to pass through um, a specific location. Um, so first of all, you get a warm front moving through. Uh, so the clouds, if you're there on the ground, what you'd see is clouds become lower and thicker, and you get some light precipitation, some showers. Um, and after the passage of that warm front, the winds would become now more southerly and temperatures would warm. So here, you know, they're starting to, that move, warm front moves through, um, for, um, forwards, then the air is then directed from the south, so off from the, uh, sort of the moist air from the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico, for, for example. Uh, notice here, by the way, you can see these black lines or dots with a, with a line behind them and symbols. Uh, these are called little weather flags, and they give you a sense of the wind direction. So you imagine you're sort of carrying a flag and kind of it's, you know, moving in one direction, the flag's flying behind you. That's kind of what you're seeing from above um, here. So you can see there's, there's a flag and, and stretching behind, showing the wind is going to the northeast here, for example. Anyway, um, so you have this warm air moving forwards. Uh, at uh, northeast at the, after that point. Um, and then the cold front will move in. And if you, again, if you're on the ground, you'd see a wall of dark clouds um, uh, kind of approach you. Um, and then with that would be associated once those clouds reach you, heavy precipitation and sometimes hail as well. If some of those water droplets are very, very cold in the atmosphere above, above, above the cloud, condensation level, and they can be, uh, if there's large up, updrafts and downdrafts, those, those water drops can turn to ice and they gradually get bigger, larger and larger um, at, at height until gravity again takes hold and you get um, hailstone um, falling. But also precipitate um, tornadoes can be associated with these uh, cold fronts as well. Um, after the passage of the cold front, winds become more northerly. You kind of um, seeing the spiral come around. Um, so the air is coming now from what, maybe sort of you know, the northern part of the state in Canada um, and the temperatures will drop because of that. Uh, there's two cross, cross sections on here, by the way, um, A and B, which kind of show you uh, these approaching um, uh, and pass, passing fronts and how, how it look, look, looks like. So the bottom one, especially, you can see that warm front um, um, on, on the bottom right. If you look at the slides behind the picture of me, um, and um, there's um, basically it's a low angle gradient warm front with the light precipitation and it's clearing sky, with some clouds, and then you have the um, the cold front come in with a steep gradient. All right, so um, they're producing these fronts, especially cold fronts. You have these, um, uh, as far as weather, things called thunderstorms developing often. Um, so the features of a thunderstorm, um, firstly, it has thunder, which is caused by lightning, as we see, but, um, but a bit more than that. Um, the actual rain clouds themselves uh, in these heavy uh, you know, uh, uh, rain showers associated with thunderstorms, they, 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 for, they form in what are called cumulonimbus clouds, these big, very tall rain clouds, heavy rainfall, lightning, which causes thunder. So this uh, release of electricity through the atmosphere, basically we'll see that that expands the air by heating it incredibly quickly and that produces the, the thunder clap. You also get occasional hailstone um, in this turbulent air above as well. Um, and the occurrence of thunderstorms, uh, well on Earth, Literally now or any time, there's literally 2,000 in progress at any one time on Earth. Um, in the United States, uh, about 100,000 uh, per year in the US, every year. Uh, most frequent in the southeast, in Florida, and in the eastern uh, Gulf Coast regions, kind of the panhandle of Florida and a little bit west of there, but for the eastern side of the Gulf Coast and into Florida. That's where you get most um, of these um, thunderstorms, especially. Uh, it's, it's mainly to do with this warm air um, um, moving up in the way um, as we place down there. So thund thunderstorms, just, just mentioning at the top, would have mentioned um, how you actually form or cause thunder. It's lightning essentially superheats the air in less than a second, a fraction of a second, to as high as 33,000 degrees Celsius. So very high temperatures in, a, like I say, less than a second. And that expands the air very, very quickly from that super that extreme heat. And that causes the, the sound of thunder, the thunder clap. Uh, it sort of expands explosively, essentially, the air. Um, so here, I said it in the southeast, the occurrence. So here, the average number of days per year with thunderstorms. And um, Florida, the reds, uh, um, 
so uh, the highest highest ones and um, for here you know 100 thunderstorms per year almost you know not quite one at one every three or four days is essentially a thunderstorm down there um still also a lot in, in sort of the southern states of america as well the midwest uh but less as you go to, to um, towards northward towards the great lakes or or, or, or to the rockies etc or the northeast so they're generally kind of in the middle region and um and southern states and the, the southeast in particular So stages of development as you go from kind of these sort of small Apache clouds to, to form these cumulonimbus uh, thunderstorm clouds. Um, all thunderstorms require to, to form warm air and moist air. So if you have warm rising air, it's already moist, therefore it's already a, a high humidity. Uh, you'll quickly get saturation and uh, you'll get these large, very large clouds forming um, and um, thunderstorms developing. Um, so rising air, so you need high surface temperatures, hence them being common in the southern states and, and the southeast Florida. And most common during the day in the um, peak temperatures of the, um, the afternoon, the late afternoon, early even, evening in the day. So you can take them as stages of development, uh, with, um, so eventually precipitation forms. Um, so on the bottom, it goes through the cumulus stage of clouds, uh, then through the um, we have large sort of, um, updrafts of warm air, uh, rising warm air, and then you get the mature stage where precipitation, uh, lots, lots of condensation, and you have precipitation and heavy rain. Um, but then the dissipating stage um, is essentially all that cold rain um, cools the space, the air below, so it stops any, you know, you lower the temperatures below the clouds, therefore there's no rising air, therefore there's no, you know, moisture, it doesn't get to condensed and saturate so um uh, you kind of it cuts itself off if you will by by raining <laughs> essentially that's why thunderstorms are quite short-lived often um so associated with the thunderstorm heavy precipitation gusty wind lightning and hail and like i said the cooling effects of precipitation marks the end of thunderstorm um activity all right so um associated with thunderstorms are these phenomena called tornadoes which um cause huge havoc um, every year, especially in the United States, we have more tornadoes in the U.S. than, than any other country um, on the world, um, especially so especially North America. It's all to do with the geography of North America and how the air masses kind of move up and, and collide, as we'll see uh, in the interior part of, 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 of North America. Um, so tornadoes um, associated with thunderstorms, uh, you can see this big spiraling vortex on, on the photo photograph here. Um, and you see, by the way, before the, you see this spiraling vortex, um, they're actually almost invisible. Uh, so before that moisture is drawn down from the clouds and the dust is drawn up from the ground, uh, they're, they're, they're almost uh, invisible, but then they quickly uh, develop the water to form this, this typical um, tornado shape. So it's a rotating column of air that extends down from a cumulonimbus cloud. Uh, often without warning as well. Um, low pressure inside causes the air to rush in, so the very low pressure in the middle, the air also goes from high to, to low pressure um, as wind, and rotating winds can exceed 310 miles per hour. Incredibly fast wind speeds, the strongest, the, the fastest of all um, her, um, tornadoes. And you know, the, they are the strongest wind speeds on earth are caused by, by these things, and they can you know, like, cause huge destruction um, on the ground in terms of damage to buildings, and really anything else that they, they, they travel across. Um, they usually only last a, a few minutes or seconds. Uh, they kind of touch down, do their damage, uh, move quite erratically and quite fast, and then kind of suck back up into the, into the cloud base. Um, so they can be about one mile wide as well. They can be very large. People think maybe they're quite narrow, but sometimes, especially the outer part, you can't really see it, um, um, but it can be up to a mile in, in, in diameter. Uh, typically they're not that large, but they can be up to that. Um, they stay on the ground for typically over 50 miles, so tr they track ac uh, across the ground, not just in a straight line, they kind of go sideways, so again they're very hard to predict where that hazard is being brought to um, once they've touched the ground. The average forward speed as it moves forward um, is around about 30 miles per hour, but that can vary, it can be stationary, or it can move as fast as 70 miles per hour, so you can't outrun um a tornado um so you need to not be there essentially um 
or in a shelter um, when, when they are touched down. Um, so you get, we'll come on to that. You have things called sh tornado shelters or the advice if, if um, or you evacuate very quickly um, or you find if you have a basement, great, uh, uh, that's good. Or the, the most interior part of your, of your house, essentially. Um, so tornadoes can cause, an, well, the tornadoes do cause an average of 70 fatalities um, in the US every year and around about 1,500, um, so 1,500 injuries in the US each year. So 70 fatalities, that's every year 70 people die from, uh, the figures vary, 60 to 70. So that, that's a lot of people from just from tornadoes and a lot of people injured from them. So, you know, there's something that we need to be um, aware of and um, kind of take note. Uh, when, when you get watches and warnings about, about their uh, po probability in your area. Um, here's a famous uh, tornado from 1999, uh, the big Oklahoma uh, tornado disaster back then. Um, and here, if you look at this, um, this neighborhood, these communities here, you can see hopefully um, um, there's a kind of discolored brown kind of path that goes through these, these, these um, these neighborhoods and you can basically if you look carefully all the houses in this long path this swathe of, 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 of um, residential area is destroyed essentially um, in, in that path so that's where the, the tornado moved through completely destroyed those houses completely as well um, um, uh, when it moved um, and that's why actually many people died during this during this event uh, Okay, um, I'll ask you to watch this clip, please. Uh, follow the link. Um, so kind of stop the video and, and watch this. It's a very, very good, it's only three minutes long uh, by the National Geographic. Very informative. Uh, that tells you all about tornadoes, how they develop, and very much basically what, what I'm presenting in the slide, it, they cover also. Um, and you see them kind of, you know, the, the footage of, of tornadoes in action, if you will. So um, do have a have a look at that um, clip from the National Geographic. It's only um, three minutes long. Okay, so um, tornadoes in terms of occurrence, uh, average um, in the United States around about um, 770, so 700 to 800 per year in the US. Uh, they have a tornado season uh, from April through to June, sometimes March through to June actually. Um, and the formation of tornadoes is associated with very large thunderstorms or huge thunderstorms called supercells. And the formation within these are of something called mesoclines. Uh, and a mesocline often precedes tornado formation. So mesoclines, uh, I'll show you a diagram and a photograph in the next slide, are these big vertical cylinders of air. It looks like a huge cloud um, just slowly rotating. And they can be about two to six miles across these, these mesoclines. So here on the bottom left, you have a photograph of one, and this and this one with, with a tornado coming out at the bottom as well. Uh, but you can see this big uh, rotating air mass a few miles across. Here it is in diagram diagrammatic form on the top. And these are kind of key to, um, once you can see one of these developing, you know there's a, a strong probability or possibility that you may have a tornado coming out at the bottom of one of these. Um, so how you form these things, the formation of a metacline, um, Often precedes tornado formation, not always. Um, you don't have to have one, but they, they, should opt, they often are associated with them. Um, it's also to do with vortexes of air being kind of upturned from, from a horizontal to a vertical. So here on the top left, you have um, um, a, a vortex of air where weaker winds at ground level and stronger above. And that you have this spiral of air at ground level. And then with sort of erratic uplifts of air, you can upend that spiral and make it vertical. Um, there's still a lot of research onto the physics of how this happens, by the way, uh, current research um, uh, into the mechanisms of this. But it's a, this is the basic um, mechanism which we think how it, how it occurs. Then you have that metacline moving around, and that's when sometimes there's a high probability of tornadoes coming out the bottom of them. Bottom of them. Um, tornado damage or wind speeds can get extreme. Like I said, they can go up to 300 miles per hour, but anything you know over 150, which is hurricane strength winds, category five hurricane strength winds we're talking. Um, so stronger than Category 5, much stronger, they can cause, um, pick up huge things and, and move them around. Here, this vehicle, a large vehicle on the right, um, it's complete, its body work has been completely kind of ripped off from the wind. It's that high. It's been, um, and, uh, you know, thrown into a tree here. Uh, here you can see this metal work's been, uh, been basically impaled right through a, a telegraph pole here. Um, 
and uh, so it tells you, you know, the, the, the amount of force and vo uh, wind velocity that, that's required to do that. So this is why you do not want to be on the ground or you need to be in shelter, certainly, um, or away from the area as quickly as possible when, you, when there's tornadoes um, touching the ground. Um, in terms of incidents in the United States, there's a, there's a map here. So annual tornado incidents per 10,000 square miles, basically um, where, the, where, uh, where do you have the, the highest concentration of tornadoes sort of spatially? And it's these red colors, uh, you see the highest ones are in the state of um, Oklahoma, especially, and also in sort of Northern Texas, uh, you get very high here. So it says nine per, nine tornadoes per um, 10,000 square miles. Um, but you see all the states up there from sort of um, Texas or um, Oklahoma and upwards, um, up the kind of the, the Great Plains area, um, there, that's, that's what we call Tornado Alley. I'll show you that as a map again, a uh, separate map soon, but, um, but that's where you're in know, the famous Tornado Alley. That's because it's called that because that's where you get a lot of tornadoes um, in that area. You can see the season, by the way, that the, um, the annual um, uh, chart here, and it seems to the increase in tornadoes during uh, the summer period. So the tornadoes form where there are large differences in atmospheric pressure in short distances, usually at, at front. Um, and tornadoes require three air masses. They require a cold, air, a, dry, a cold, dry air mass, these big, large bodies of air which move around and collide at front. So a cold, dry uh, air mass, a warm, secondly, a warm, dry air mass, and thirdly, a warm, moist, uh, dry. So the, the collision or um, a movement together of these three air masses gives you a very high chance of um, tornadoes. Um, so cold air, you be forcing air aloft, as we talked about very quickly, um, but also warm fronts will also be forcing air upwards on the bottom here. And often where they they come together, uh, pass by each other is where you have tornadoes. So here is a map of the United States and you can see all this going on. So here you're coming down from Canada, essentially in the northern parts of the states, uh, Montana, uh, this cold, dry air mass moving southwards. You have a, a warm, moist air coming off the Gulf of Mexico moving northwards, but also you have a smaller, warm, dry air body of air mass moving um, from the arid parts of, of, of um, Mexico. Um, and you also see a warm front associated with the, right, of the northward moving warm air, and a cold front associated with the um, south southerly moving uh, cold, dry air body. And where they kind of pass each other, that boundary where they kind of slide past each other, that uh, you can see here, that's where you get a lot of tornadoes. That's where Tornado Alley is kind of located here, especially in, 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 um, in Oklahoma and, and northern Texas, but up into uh, Kansas as well, and Nebraska and, and South Dakota. All those states have, and a bit of Col uh, eastern Colorado, all have a very um, high incidences of tornadoes because of these um, the juxtaposition, the movement of these air masses together, especially the, the, the cold, dry air and the warm moist air. So that's why, by, by the way, the United States has that configuration of air masses. That's why the, North America basically has, has so many um, um, tornadoes. Uh, so tornadoes, as I said about wind speeds, um, they can also be measured on a scale um, of damage, essentially. Um, so like hurricanes go from category one to five. Uh, there's a scale for um, um, tornadoes from, um, I think it actually starts at zero up to five. Um, it's called the Fujita scale or the enhanced Fujita scale. Um, so they're classified by the most intense damage that they produced along their path. So you look at the sort of damage and then you can correlate that to wind speeds generally, sort of typical wind speed that's associated with, with that type of damage. Um, be it just smaller damage or, you know, building, the whole buildings are basically destroyed. It's based on surveys of an area, and then you can give it um, as, as a, on a Fujita scale. So this is it, uh, the Fujita scale. Uh, yeah, it starts from F0 and then goes up to an F5. Um, um, F scale wind typical damage. So it's all these descriptors tell you them. So the, I'll just I'll mention the, the bottom one, incredible damage. At wind speeds in F5, the strongest of all tornadoes. Uh, wind speeds between 261 and 318 miles per hour, incredible damage, strong frame houses leveled off the foundations, that's strong frame houses, and swept away. Automobile sized missiles fly through the air in excess of 100 yards, you know, <laughs> so you can see the top right, uh, an upended um, large SUV car there, that's been thrown through the air by, um, uh, um, by the wind. 
trees are debarked uh, from the high wind, etc. And then if you go up, it gradually gets kind of destruction gets less and less, but still a lot of, lot of damage uh, from even these sort of, um, lower um, Vegeta scale um, tornadoes. I mean, even in F1, mobile homes pushed off foundations or overturned, for example. So they're all, they're all um, you know, can do a lot of damage. These are all kind of hurricane strength winds, essentially, uh, these lower ones. Uh, so tornado forecasting, what to do about this? It's all about uh, being warned uh, that the, the probability of a tornado and then of actually have one's in sight or has been sighted. So they are difficult to forecast. They're quite erratic when we don't, uh, to, to, they, 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 they form. Um, uh, they're hard to predict that they will form. So there's firstly a tornado watch is put out to alert the public to the possibility of tornadoes. Uh, so they have the right conditions to form tornadoes. Um, maybe you have a metacline forming or maybe because of the thunderstorms, et cetera, there's a strong possibility. That's when the tornado watch is, is, is put out. A tornado warning is issued when the tornado is actually sighted or is indicated on a, on a weather, draw, weather radar, sorry, a Doppler radar. And um, once that is, you need to be out of the area or very quickly uh, take shelter. And we're talking minutes after the warning. It can be sort of an average of, you know, so 15, 30 minutes before uh, it gets to, gets to your, your location. Um, so um, you have minutes. That's why generally uh, you might not be able to evacuate. You need to get into a, 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 a nearby um, tornado shelter if you can, or the basement of your house, or the most even interior part of your house if you can. Uh, you can get kind of purpose built or you do uh, tornado shelters. You can see them um, here. So um, um, it's all about watching the warnings, knowing when and where to take shelter. So a lot of public education in this, in, especially in the States, in, in Tornado Alley. Uh, but, but, um, and you need to know sort of what supplies should be kept in shelters as well. You may have to be there for a day, et cetera, or more. Um, and that's where I'm going to leave it. So it's a, it's a shorter one, this one, on tornadoes and thunderstorms. So, um, yep. Yeah, so thank you for joining me again, and I'll see you again soon.